So, dear, dear colleagues, welcome to this uh, sponsor session, uh, corporate forum, and um, I would like to introduce myself. I'm uh, Tony Skulian from the University of Bern, Switzerland, and I have the privilege to chair this uh, session this afternoon. And as you all know, here on Recast, it is a quite um, innovative material that uh, has been introduced uh, a couple of years ago also in the dental field. And in the last years, we have achieved quite a number of uh, interesting results in different areas of oral tissue regeneration. This symposium will uh, try to put together the most relevant information regarding the use of hyaluronic acid in perontal surgery, but also in oral surgery, soft tissue, and hard tissue augmentation, because the evidence increased quite a lot in the last uh, couple of years. So we can uh, truly say that we have a material that um, meets really the standards of uh, being used uh, on a routine basis uh, in uh, patient treatment. And um, before going to introduce the presenters of today, I would like to uh, give you a small overview about the biologic background and what was the rationale to start working on this topic. And uh, in fact, when we talk about hyaluronic acid, we are talking about a material that has been described almost 100 years ago for the first time uh, by Karl Meyer and co-workers. And uh, in fact, it was isolated from the uh, vitreous organ of the eye. And in fact, um, we are talking about a large polymeric uh, glucosaminoglycan that um, uh, can be found in, in the, the organs of the developing um, fetus and then uh, a newly born um, child in uh, a very high concentrations. And what we know from the literature that this molecule accumulates in the extracellular matrix. And if you compare the wound helix, for example, in a, uh, in a child, and you compare it to the older persons, you see that the, the tissue healing is much more uh, faster and uh, scarless. And this is probably also due uh, to the uh, higher concentration of hyaluronic acid. And uh, in fact, uh, we have um, thousands of papers, not from the dental field, but from the biology and chemistry, showing that uh, we have an effect on uh, regulation, uh, very, uh, various inflammatory processes, cell migration, and it modulates, in fact, the activity of a number of growth factors uh, that are relating to uh, wound healing. And I became interested uh, in this topic many years ago when we started, of course, in some um, basic experiments. And uh, I would like to show you only some, um, uh, some um, data uh, that uh, indicate that uh, we have an effect of hyaluronic acid on soft tissue cells, especially parental ligament cells and uh, oral fibroblasts. And if you look at uh, uh, these uh, two slides, you will observe that the hyaluronic acid formulations that can be uh, processed in a cross-linked or non-cross-linked formulation, they have um, effect on the proliferative, proliferative abilities of the parental ligament cells and uh, um, on the gingival fibroblast. And you can see the two curves, the red and the uh, green one, that are significantly higher compared to the black one that is, in fact, uh, the control. And uh, if you look now at the migration of these cells uh, in a wound, you can clearly see that uh, the more uh, cells we see, the higher the concentration of hyaluronic acid is on this plate. Especially if you look at this uh, smaller plate where you see the number of cells, you can see an increased density of soft tissue cells on these surfaces. 
compared to the control. Interestingly, these formulations have also an uh, important effect uh, on certain markers that are related to a scarless wound healing. And uh, we did a number of experiments looking also at the expression of growth factors. Uh, some growth factors that, that are uh, strongly related to uh, regeneration. For example, platelet derived growth factor, uh, fibroblast growth factor, FGF2 or IGF, uh, that uh, in fact are attracted into the wound, are kept in the wound, because they are released from the cells that we find in the wound. And in fact, uh, in an indirect way, we have a higher concentration of these growth factors. And uh, in fact, we have also one uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine expression uh, in uh, these um, um, cells. And when we look at some of the uh, markers that are involved in extracellular matrix remodeling, we can see that, in fact, these markers have been triggered, and you can see all, um, over and over the same uh, pattern of uh, tissue response. So we found out that uh, henric acid, uh, especially those that we used, is the here then BG, that, uh, especially the uh, crossing formulation, they have um, uh, fully biocompatibility without any negative effect on cell viability, and uh, they promoted cell proliferation and migration, and especially they triggered the expression of some uh, factors and indicators that are uh, consistent with scarless wound healing. And uh, in fact, uh, we have a strong effect via the growth factors on influencing uh, extracellular matrix remodeling, but not only on soft tissue cells, but also on um, some precursor cells for uh, bone formation. And we looked in a, uh, another study on the effect of hyaluronic acid on uh, bone precursor cells, and uh, these are standard cell uh, types that we can um, uh, process. And uh, these cells uh, increased in proliferation, as you can see on these two slides, uh, compared to the control. And uh, the genes that encoded bone matrix proteins uh, had a, a significantly stronger expression. Interestingly, the stemness of these cells uh, remained uh, for a longer time when they came into contact with hyaluronic acid. As you can see it on this uh, uh, histologic slide, the control indicates a stronger mineralization uh, compared uh, to the uh, test uh, uh, um, groups. And uh, we can, uh, of course, now they say that hyaluronic acid also stimulates the proliferation of osteoprogenitors and enhances the expression of gene encoding bone matrix proteins, but also maintains the stemness of the cells, which indicates that these uh, uh, cells may differentiate even at a later stage into um, into a more mineralized or less mineralized tissue. Um, what is now the clinical relevance? If we look now at some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, clinical cases, and this is only one uh, example, just to show you how we use this, uh, this, mate, uh, this material. For example, when we are uh, dealing with um, uh, some uh, soft tissue defects, uh, as you all know, I go a little bit faster with this uh, presentation, just to show the technique. Uh, when we prepare, for example, um, a flap or a tunnel in order to uh, move the tissues coronally, uh, what we have is a bleeding in, in this area. And uh, in fact, uh, we were looking for a material that has the capacity to stabilize the blood clot. And that was also one of the reasons um, because I have started to use, uh, in fact, uh, this material in order to have a material that interacts positively with the blood, attracts the growth factors, and, uh, in fact, uh, stabilizes uh, the entire uh, wound area. Of course, we are using it uh, in conjunction with a graft, and uh, let me show you how uh, we apply the material. It has a quite uh, high viscosity, and it sticks to the surface uh, of the... Uh, roots. 
In other words, we do not need to to dry the root surfaces when we when we use it, and I think that's a, a positive uh, effect uh, and uh, characteristics of the material. Of course, you all know the surgical technique, so I just go a little bit faster. Uh, the wound healing is always uh, very positive without any inflammatory reaction, and uh, we may not need uh, to give any anti. Uh, antibiotics or anti-phlogistic uh, uh, medication. So I uh, just go ahead and show you just this case um, because uh, we may improve uh, the wound healing and until now in recession coverage or soft tissue surgery uh, we have uh, quite uh, positive outcomes in single recessions but also in multiple defects. So what we know nowadays uh, is that hyaluronic acid positively influences the cells involved in peronta wound healing and regeneration, and especially the use of cross-link formulations like uh, uh, the Hyaluronic BG may additionally improve the effects. So that was a small introduction of the session, and now I would like to uh, call upon stage um, the first uh, speaker from Japan, and this is... Uh, uh, Professor Shirakata from Kagoshima. And uh, Professor Shirakata performed a number of studies uh, in preclinical models uh, in order to show the effect of um, hyaluronic acid alone or with certain carriers, collagen based carriers, on parental wound healing and regeneration, different uh, animal uh, models. Um, Yoshinori Shirakata, please. Dr. Shirakata, come. On stage, and uh, at the end of the session, we are going to have uh, a discussion. And please uh, feel free to uh, send us questions, um, and uh, we will answer them at the end. Uh, so, thank you for your kind, uh, <coughs> kind introduction, Tony. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Uh, as a first speaker in this session, I would like to talk about the potential utility of cross-linked hyaluronic acid gel in periodontal wound healing and regeneration for various periodontal defects in experimental animal models, providing preclinical data for further discussion. <coughs> hyaluronic acid, or HA, is a ubiquitous non-sulfate glucosamine glycan in body tissues and forms a critical component in the extracellular matrix. HA also has several characteristics such as bacteriostatic, biocompatible, anti-inflammatory, anti edematous properties, making this a useful biomaterial with potential for accelerating healing in regenerative medical and dental procedures. HA behaves as a liquid when dissolved in water. So, modulation of HA by cross-linking may improve mechanical properties by creating gels that have a firmer structure and are able to resist degradation. Molecular weight of HA has also been affected the response of <coughs> HA to various tissues. High molecular weight of HA also reportedly predominate in healthy tissues and typically inhibit inflammation. So, we focused on the clinical use of a specially developed cross-linked high molecular weight HA in the field of periodontology. So, to what extent can we expect predictable periodontal wound regeneration following the application of HA to periodontal defects such as these? <coughs> Currently, when we evaluate outcomes following periodontal regenerative therapies, the endpoints shown here are used to varying degrees. In particular, histology is considered the true endpoint for providing periodontal regeneration. Theoretically speaking, human block biopsy is, con is the only method to demonstrate periodontal regeneration. However, 
This approach has several drawbacks, including a lack of control treatment, the use of hoplastis with low regenerative potential, and obvious escal issues. Thus, given the scope for the escal use of experimental animals, histological outcomes, including quantitative analysis using these histomorphometric parameters and qualitative analysis, have extensively been reported in preclinical studies. So, I would like to show the result of a series of preclinical studies evaluating the effect of HA on periodontal wound healing and regeneration in these periodontal defects in dogs. First, we evaluated clinical and histological healing of buccal gingival recession treated with coronary advanced flap with or without cross-linked hyaluronic acid gel in dogs. In this study, we surgically created buccal gingival recession defect on bilateral upper canines. After eight weeks plaque accumulation, the chronic defect were randomly assigned at, and randomly treated with either CL, sorry, CF or CF with HA, as demonstrated in these pictures. As you can see here, <coughs> all the treated sites, both in the CAF and CAF HA treatment, showed favorable clinical healing and root coverage without any apparent complications for 10 weeks. However, gingival redness seemed to remain longer in the CAF group. In addition, we identified the significant differences in clinical attachment level and the width of gingival recession favoring CAF HA treatment at 10 weeks compared to CAF alone. These histological images may provide an overview following the CAF and CAF HA treatments. In the CAF treatments, newborn formation was limited at the most apical portion of the defect, and newborn was noted extending from the coronal part, <coughs> coronal, uh, 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 newborn formation was extend, noted extending from the coronal, yeah, sorry, apical portion to a coronal portion in the defect in the CAF HA treatments. More interestingly, higher magnification of these framed area on the denuded root surface reveal minimum new cementum and connective tissue fibers aligned parallel to the root surfaces. In contrast, dense functionally oriented collagen fibers with many blood vessels are clearly evident between new cementum and new bone in the CF HA treatments. This table summarizes the histomorphometric analysis. Some parameters in the CF HA treatments were comparable to those obtained in the CF group. However, particularly for these three parameters, that is new cementum, new attachment, and new bone formation, the values in the CF HA treatments were significantly greater than that obtained in the CF group. These results indicate that the combination of HA and CAF represent a novel modality for promoting periodontal wound regeneration in gingival recession defects. Second, we evaluated the effect of periodontal wound healing and regeneration for two oral interbony defects in dogs. In this study, we surgically created two oral interbony defects on bilateral mandibular premolars. These defects were randomly assigned for treatment groups. The first group treated with open flap development, or OFD. The second group received OFD and grafting of cross-linked porcine collagen matrix, or CM. The third group received OFD and HA. The fourth group received OFD and the combination of HA and CM. Here you can see clinical healing was uneventful at all sites 
after observation periods. Here are representative overviews following the four different treatments. Regarding newborn formation, the combination therapy using HA and CM tended to toward, tended <coughs> provide superior result to the other groups. However, significant differences were not detected among the groups, possibly due to spontaneous bone healing occurring with surgically created intrabony defects in dogs. However, higher magnification of these framed area on the denuded root surfaces in the OFD, and particularly in the OFD and CM groups, no or only a small amount of new cementum was observed with sparse collagen fibers detached from or parallel to the root surfaces. In contrast, dense uh, in contrast, you can clearly see new cellular or acellular cementum with inserting collagen fibers landing perpendicular to the root surfaces in this HA and HACM treatments. In addition, highly vascularized periodont ligament-like tissue had formed between new cementum and new bone, maintaining its width up to the coronal portion to the defect. Histomorphometric analysis demonstrated <coughs> tendency toward a greater formation of new cementum and new bone in the HA applied group compared to the OFD and CM group. However, particularly for these two parameters, new attachment rings and periodontal ligament scores obtained in the HA applied group were statistically significantly different when compared to the OFD group. These results indicate that HA alone or in combination with CM promotes periodontal wound healing and regeneration into all interbony defects. Finally, we evaluated the effect of HA <coughs> gel with or without a collagen matrix in the treatment of class refurcation defects in dogs. In this study, we also created class refurcation defect in bilateral mandibular premolars. The furcation defect then received one of the four treatments from the previous study, namely OFD, OFD with CM, OFD with HA, and OFD with HA and CM. Here you can see clinical healing was again uneventful at all sites. After 10 weeks, we performed histological evaluations. Here are representative histological overviews following the four different treatments. Compared to the OFD and CM treatments, newborn formation was consistently observed in the HA and HA CM treatments. However, complete fabrication closure was not observed in any of the defects following these treatment modalities. Then, looking at higher magnification of these framed area on the denuded root surfaces, particularly in the OFD and CM groups, new cement formation was confined to the apical portion of the defect with apical migration of junction epithelium, indicating rather reparative type of periodontal healing. In contrast, dense functionally oriented collagen fibers uh, again, clearly observable between new cementum and new bone in the HA and HACM treatment groups. Regarding area measurements, no statistically significant differences were detected among the group, although connective tissue areas were smaller and new bone areas were larger in the HA applied groups compared to the other groups. If we look at the result of linear measurements, statistically significant differences were observed in these parameters among the groups. Interesting again, the groups received HA and HACM 
デモンストレイティール、スタティスカリーシグニフィケントアマウントオブニューアタッチメントアンニューセメンタム、when compared to OFD groups。These results also indicate that the use of HA with or without CM positively influence periodontal wound healing in surgically created acute type class t h r o u g h fracation defects. In conclusion, what I would like to emphasize with all this is that synthetic HA offers a safe and effective biomodulator that consistently facilitates periodontal wound regeneration characterized by new attachment formation in various periodontal defects. The positive result may be explained by numerous in vitro studies that have demonstrated HA strongly sustains blood clot stability, attracts growth factors, and increases angiogenesis and osteogenesis. However, further preclinical and clinical studies are required to develop novel strategies, including the use of HA combined with appropriate carrier or scaffolds. For period, promoting periodontal wound regeneration, especially in non contained periodontal defects. So, I also hope the following talks by outstanding <laughs> clinicians and researchers will provide many insights into indications for the clinical use of HA in a wide variety of cases. Finally, I would like to thank my <laughs> colleagues for their valuable assistance, and I really appreciate the great support for this. Oh, I have great support of r e g a d e n t for this project and for organizing this session. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. Maybe you can sit there. So, the next uh, speaker is、uh, Professor Friedman from Germany, University of Witten Herdecke. And、um, he has Quite nice data on the non surgical application、yes. of、uh, hyaluronic acid. So, dear Anton, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Tony, for your nice introduction. Dear Chairman,、uh, thank you、uh, for inviting me、uh, to share our experiences and results in regard to the、uh, non surgical application of HA, actually, in terms of clean and seal concept、um, at subgingival instrumentation. So I go clinically, but please、uh, remember all the facts and、uh, data、uh, which were presented till now, because、uh, Due to the shortness in time, I have to move on. And I want to set first、uh, the stage、uh, for your understanding why we are looking at this.、Uh, why doesn't it go forward? The clicker doesn't work. Sorry.、Uh, this one. No, I tried already. Oh, yeah, here. Here we go. Yeah. Th thanks. So, this,、uh, great. Thanks a lot,、uh, dear Chairman. So,、um, just、uh, looking at such a case, which is a quite complex、uh, stage three periodontitis case,、uh, mid 50 lady without、uh, smoking habits, but、uh, non treated periodontitis, you recognize from these、uh, initial uh, charts and uh, x rays.、Uh, He has several problems, of course, and we know, you all know, and we yesterday impressively learned again、uh, that、uh, the non surgical treatment、uh, scaling and, and instrumentation, subgingival instrumentation, will do a great job regarding the improvement of this、uh, pocketing situation and、um, moving on the patient to、uh, better conditions. And、um, looking at especially at、uh, this one, this molar, which Just received uh, the uh, scaling non surgical treatment in this dentition. We can follow、uh, as this one as the total dentition that、uh, during the course of treatment by my colleague and my former resident, Dr. Becker,、uh, the situation was resolved and we really didn't、uh, see any、uh, 
deeper pockets uh, exceeding four millimeters in depth uh, and no BOP science as uh, he closed up uh, the, his documentation. Um, now some years moved on and uh, the treatment responsibility uh, was uh, moved to Dr. Bilhan. Again, we are looking at this molar here and the molar you see there uh, for some reasons uh, shows now signs of inflammation and some recurrency of the disease and the deepening of the pockets again. So uh, we look up again at our treatment guide, what are the recommendations there, and we see so for third step of the therapy, we have to go, first of all, to the surgery. But uh, you know that the patients who have been subjected to several visits of uh, supportive periodontal treatment and uh, have been really under maintenance for uh, maybe several years in a row, they are not really keen to uh, hear that now they have to be exposed to surgery, periodontal surgery. So uh, we probably should pay attention also to this option, repeated subgingival instrumentation with or without adjunctives. And uh, talking about adjunctives and looking in the, into the literature, we find that uh, Tony's group and Maisie, um, uh, Eliza did uh, some meta-analysis uh, coming up with this data for HA application in non-surgical treatment, uh, showing that, uh, in fact, uh, this uh, adjunctive treatment has uh, some... Uh, nice effects on uh, probing depth reduction as well as on attachment level gain clinically compared to uh, conventional scaling. But there is another um, biologically active molecule which I have to introduce now, the hypochlorite gel, which also uh, is an issue in uh, this concept because uh, here the group again with uh, uh, Tony's uh, uh, participation from, from Italy showed that uh, if you combine the uh, subgingival instrumentation with the uh, uh, hypochlorite um, gel application, you have uh, a better result after six months clinically. So um, the perisol for this hypochlorite has a, a certain uh, potential to penetrate the biofilm and to uh, work against uh, the gram-negative bacteria, as we know from this um, in vitro study uh, published some years ago, where it has been shown that uh, the um, in vitro effect on the uh, gram-negative biofilm is much more expressed uh, if you compare uh, this efficacy uh, versus uh, chlorhexidine, for example. And also there are clinical publications uh, regarding the effects of uh, uh, the non-surgical application of hypochlorite gel for uh, treating uh, non-surgically the peri-implantitis uh, and peri-implant defects. So we asked uh, ourselves, maybe the combination of these two uh, different materials may have uh, uh, some additive effect on the non-surgical treatment, and um, that's how the clean and seal strategy uh, is uh, determined. So we uh, first uh, enhance the effect of subgingival instrumentation by using the chloramine gel application, and then we uh, continue after the uh, cleaning is completed subgingivally. Uh, we continue with the um, XHA for sealing the defect. So the protocol looks like this. We um, administrate first uh, the chloramine uh, gel for 30 to 40 seconds. Then we instrument, uh, preferably in this group of patients with hand instruments, maybe old school, but uh, the curates are doing the job. And finally, we uh, apply the um, hyaluronic acid gel, and this application will be repeated within the uh, first week after the visit. Then we control, uh, of course, the situation uh, in terms of the recall uh, all, uh, every three months, and uh, 12, 12 months uh, post-op, we supplement also the periapicals, and uh, we perform uh, here non-parametric statistics for this group of patients. So we calculated now uh, altogether 29 patients with a history of periodontitis, diagnosed with stages two to four, 
which of course has been, have been treated in the, at the Department of the Periodontology by uh, my co collaborators, co-workers and residents, and who then uh, entered the SPT program. Uh, there were 69% uh, females, and the, the mean age was about 55 years. Uh, all of them were normal glycemic, and uh, just two were smoking. And uh, we included into this um, approach, into this additional uh, therapy, uh, only patients who have uh, shown the history of at least two subsequently SPT visits with subgingival instrumentation of uh, sites exceeding five millimeters of probing uh, with uh, positive uh, bleeding signs without reaction to the subgingival instrumentation. So uh, baseline mean value for uh, probing depth was about seven millimeters and uh, clinical attachment loss occurred previously was about eight millimeters. We uh, calculated a total of uh, 111 sites and if we stratify by uh, single rooted and multi rooted teeth with vocation involvement, 12 vertical defects uh, were uh, in vocation involved teeth. So uh, looking at the results after six months, we uh, detect now these changes here. The graphs show the uh, change in uh, probing depth and uh, clinical attachment level. Uh, in positive way, of course, so we gained about two millimeters of clinical attachment and reduced uh, the probing depth by uh, two millimeters, uh, which means or indicates that uh, almost no additional recession was uh, recorded, and we reduced the bleeding tendency by uh, 60%. So if we stratify into the uh, groups, so we see uh, some effects uh, between the um, single-rooted and multi-rooted teeth, but I don't and go into details, uh, talking about additional pocket seal, about 25% of uh, the 99 single rooted defects were sealed completely and uh, showed a probing depth uh, to uh, close to four and less millimeters without uh, bleeding signs at six months. And uh, looking at outcomes at 12 months re-evaluation, uh, radiologically and clinically, we see in cases which I just uh, included into the presentation this kind of change in the radiographic outcome. So we see um, on a regular basis after 12 months this additional bone fill as in these two cases demonstrated. So concluding, I uh, want to uh, to finalize that these retrospective studies indicated that uh, clean and seal protocols sufficiently enhanced the outcome in these non-responding, persistent and recurrent sites. And we definitely reduced significantly uh, the need in periodontal surgery for these uh, kind of pockets and these patients. Certainly we need a higher number of cases and RCT studies to confirm the observations. I would like to acknowledge my group who has been contributing to these all cases. The paper is, the manuscript is in preparation. But uh, last of and not least, I want uh, to draw your attention also to these publications which uh, show uh, that additionally to intraoral effects of both substances, of both materials, we have indications uh, that um, hyaluronic acid and also the uh, chloramines are helpful in treating skin lesions, uh, skin injuries. And I had the chance to treat a dental hygienist from our staff after she scalded her leg, actually, by an accident at home. So she tripped over her daughter and uh, he, she had a bowl of bold, uh, boiled water in her hands. And uh, please uh, apologize for these disgusting uh, images at the beginning. But this, uh, how she contacted me two weeks after the accident happened, and she didn't do any treatment to this burned surface. So it was uh, highly inflamed, it was uh, separating, it was pus all around, and I used first the Perisolve uh, on the top of it. She conducted uh, the doctor just to ask him to get his a permission to, to undergo this treatment. She told him uh, the materials, the names. He, didn't, he was not familiar with these uh, materials, but he 
told her, well, it sounds rational in his ears, so she, she may try. That's how we did it. And uh, just documenting the outcome week per week, I have a almost daily documentation of this uh, healing process, but you see that uh, the uh, surface is completely covered, epithelized, and it improves day to day. Well, with these images, I would like to thank you for joining us. Thank you, Anton. Great. So it, you can see that we have more and more evidence on this uh, interesting topic. <clears throat> and now I would like to call, or call upon stage uh, Professor Piloni from uh, the University of Rome, Sapienza. <clears throat> and in fact, um, Professor Piloni is one of the first ones that uh, has uh, started uh, research in this field. And I have learned uh, a lot from you, Andrea. So we are happy to, to have you on stage. And uh, he will present a wonderful work on uh, Perio treatment with this uh, exciting novel material. Thank you, Chairman, for the presentation. Of course, uh, there's nothing you can learn from me, but uh, thank you for inviting me here. This is my last slide, so you should move on to the to the first one of my presentation. Okay, uh, and thank you for giving me the chance to uh, to spend this time with you. Of course, speaking about uh, uh, two molecules together, one that has been with us for several decades, EMD, and uh, um, HA that has been seen in me involved for several decades. Um, we are looking at HA in a, at a mucogingival level and in regenerative surgery and to see whether or not we, can, we could benefit out of the use of this uh, almost uh, more than 80 years old known uh, molecule, HA versus EMD. And of course, we know to the right side that uh, several decades of literature has shown how beneficial could be the use of amylogenin. Uh, but uh, at both levels, mucogingival regenerative uh, surgeries might be some difference. And uh, let's see if I can uh, prove you that this uh, could be also explain at uh, very early stages of wound healing. Um, so in case of the gingival recession types of uh, lesions, we all know from this wonderful paper written by Sandro Cortellini that we could add to the uh, flaps that grow, that are pulled down over the root surfaces that are exposed several things from a connective tissue graft, nothing, or biomolecules and if we look at this different aspects from uh, the increase of amount of keratinized tissue, the cost benefit, the long-term results, aesthetic, etc. we could see something into this with HA and especially because we started with uh, the group at UCLA looking at EMD and uh, coronal advanced, advanced flaps for root coverages how the healing pattern could be very interesting, especially in the, in the early stages of the uh, healing of the wounds. Um, but we all know that uh, 1934 was the first day when HA has proven everyone that uh, it has to do with blood clot, with inflammation, with cell proliferation and remodeling. So we could take this information and transfer all of them into mucogingival surgery. Then thanks to all my friends, including the chairman, we could uh, publish this uh, as first paper looking at the um, single recession types of defects. Uh, uh, and we basically have seen not much difference between the test and control, but the recession, the, the soft tissue receding or uh, shrinkage after the, the surgery, including the uh, patient uh, expectation after that, very different from control. And this is something that has a lot to do with the, the patient side information that we transfer from clinical application into, into the, the, uh, our expectation as clinicians. So uh, for uh, upper or lower recession types of defects, we apply HA, <coughs> and uh, what's interesting, 
for those that are seeing what happens in the first few seconds or two minutes, that uh, HA becomes a sort of meshwork. And this has to do, we will see, with blood clot stabilization. Uh, we raise the flap, we wait, and uh, from uh, a, a patient, uh, st from the patient standpoint, I mean, we see, of course, the result, the clinical result, but also what happened during the first two, three weeks after surgery. Um, one other interesting thing that you can almost visualize that. Uh, after a few seconds or one or two minutes of application of this gel, you almost see the blood that goes flow, flows through into this uh, open spaces. So something like attracting the blood clot and stabilizing the clot for the beneficial effect of, of the attachment of soft tissues. I don't know what happened to this slide, but at least we see the, the before and after like this. <clears throat> And uh, so we treated single recession types of defects, not only them, but uh, uh, we started uh, many years ago looking at the uh, multiple recessions by applying, again, uh, HA over the exposed root surfaces. Uh, and we'll see why we're, we're not afraid of seeing blood flowing through this uh, application. Uh, the 24-hour healing, which we'd worked uh, on, uh, you'll see, uh, for several years in the healing. Um, so we concluded uh, three years, four years ago in, uh, at the Europeo 9 that there, is, there might be some beneficial effect, especially for patient, to reduce patient morbidity with the use of HA. When it comes to infrabony defects, um, of course, we have a lot, of, a, a huge amount of information uh, from EMD. Uh, of course, we treat in severe types of, uh, of infrabony lesions. Uh, and uh, thanks to Tony, to Ishinori, from many sources, we could, uh, we could get information at all aspects of uh, periodontal tissue support, cementum, PDL, uh, intermembranous bone formation. Uh, back in 1998, we started that, and uh, in 2020, we published this paper looking at 24 uh, months uh, uh, control clinical trial results to see that HA alone, uh, compared to controls, gives us the, uh, not only the clinical, but also the radiological aspect of something that uh, has to do with all tissues. Although there is, was no uh, statistical significant clinical improvements compared to baseline, but something that in the long term helped at least uh, the patient expectations with, by looking at this, uh, reduced shrinkage of marginal tissue. So we wanted to investigate why, in the long run, when we both use HA into mucogingival surgery to, for, for gaining aesthetical, uh, aesthetic uh, clinical results, or for gaining tissue from the deepest part of the infrabony lesion going upwards or downwards in case of this type of infrabony defects, and see that in the long run, up to a few years later, we see a very uh, minimally reduced, this is a, a video taken with a, an iPhone by Maya Janice that she wanted to show me what happened with this uh, papilla that uh, after two years is still there with uh, very little <coughs> uh, contraction at the, in the long run. Um, Again, this can be with application of HA alone or in combined fashion that we'll see later on with the, our colleagues. But something here has to do with early healing. Uh, number one, we all know that when we apply EMD, we need to prepare the root surface in the best way possible, not to have some blood flow in there, because we know from 2012 that uh, somehow EMD gets not really activated or disactivated in the presence of blood. <clears throat> and we know, uh, on the contrary, that uh, since many years ago, uh, HA has to do with clot stabilization, has to play with clot. It has to do in this way because clot has to intermingle and play with HA. Uh, there are uh, really so many publications into this uh, relationship with HA and blood. I'm not here to, you know, present uh, what happened in uh, more than five and six decades. But by the time we, we, we look at HA, we have to see it together playing with blood, because 
of course, it creates an immediate meshwork that stays stable for some cellular reaction that we will see very soon. Uh, so, uh, back to uh, EMD, we all know from this one, uh, wonderful uh, review by uh, Dieter Bossard in uh, Switzerland that uh, it plays a role by, by uh, creating the perfect uh, environment, biological environment for cells, for growth factors to play together. So, it is not a direct uh, effect. But uh, when we look at the early healing events, we should really put our attention into something that happens in a few hours rather than weeks or months or years. And back to the uh, potential of HA that you can read here, including the regulation of collagen and the formation to avoid the formation of scars, we are looking at 80 years of re literature. So again, 24 hours, three days, what happens with HA? There is nothing so far that shows us that uh, EMD has to do or has a beneficial effect within 24 hours, 48 hours, three days. So this is a review that we could publish some time ago. But uh, we all know, uh, of course, at the, to the other side, that by creating uh, clinically or into the lab, uh, a, fa a fake wound, we know that cells, by getting together, they require 24 hours as a time. <clears throat> and this is the literature that we're looking very interestingly now in the recent years, especially in my group in Sapienza. So we are interested in looking what happens between uh, time zero and 24 hours when cells have to migrate and close a wound. So we know that by the time we place an incision, and uh, Tony Scula makes better incisions than I do, that a keratinocyte sends a message down there to the connective tissue, and the fibroblast becomes another cell, which is called myofibroblast, which has some sort of tension to prepare the closure of the wound. So we do place a suturing method, and we get margins together. But over there, something at the molecular biological uh, level ha happens, including cells and ES e extracellular matrix products like HA. So I started looking at the, this two different environments, attached gingival vera mucosa, we, to, we did the punch on humans and published both in 2017, 2021 to show what happens within 24 hours. And we all know that something here, including gene expression, has to do with HA, including this last study that uh, tells us that MMP1, 2, 9, locks, for example, this expression has to do with the collagen construction around wounds. And so this has to be driven by a molecule. So where HA, when HA is there, the wound closes much, much better than when there is not there. <coughs> and we invented this early wound dealing score, but this is not to do with my presentation, just to tell you that we use we use uh, immediate understanding from a clinical standpoint that the wound is going towards a, a, a correct uh, pathway. And so at 24 hours, we see very different uh, pattern of healing when HA is present or not. So at the end, uh, um, we, we should uh, not compare, but at least we should keep in our mind that uh, these are the things that are together with the role of HA, not only in periodontal surgery, not only for soft tissues, but also for hard tissues around teeth and bones in general, binds fibrinogen, loosening the clot while also stabilizing the clot. We know that has to do with the wound and the endothelial cells. It regulates collagen production. Um, a fetus, when is operated by the fetal surgeons does not heal with scarring. There's no scar in the fetus because the fetus is like a sponge of HA. It regulates inflammation, reduction inflammatory response. And these are the things that you might see with HA and EMD as well. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I hope you allow me to tell you why today is emotional for me because uh, exactly 30 years ago in June, 
I graduated with my master program at UCLA, and I already have spent three years asking the group of uh, Professor Bernard in the bomb biology department if there was a way to play with HA. So I hope you can see, if you hear the sound, I asked to hear the, to make, put the sound here, because they're saying this doctor is going back to Rome hoping to work with hyaluronic acid and the application in periodontal surgery, and uh, that's okay, it's fine. Um, thanks to this man that in 2012 sent me a mail saying I have something useful for the dental application. So I owe uh, Dr. Klaus Lösch a great deal of help to make this uh, story going to this uh, point. Thank you very much. Great. Don't laugh. <laughs> Andrea, it was a fantastic Grazie. presentation, and I have to tell you, you didn't change at all, huh? In the last 10 or 30 years. Very little. Thank no, you. nothing. <laughs> Grazie, Don. So I'm uh, very happy to call upon stage Professor Bozic from Zagreb, Croatia, and uh, Darko has very nice data on uh, bone regeneration with different combinations with hyaluronic acid. You have to press to the left, huh? the left button. Okay, okay. Oh, it's working. <coughs> oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I thank all of the, everybody, and I thank Tony and Regadent for inviting me, and I'm gonna show you a little bit of the story what I've been working on for the last four years. Not only, and uh, I'm not gonna talk about GBR, Kaufman is gonna talk about that later, but talk about the combination approach of using hyaluronic acid in deep intrabony defects. And um, all of the previous speakers set a really a good stage for, for, for this topic too. Uh, and, to, and I'm just gonna uh, corroborate some of the information that they provided with some new data. And uh, we're gonna talk about the new concept of utilizing hyaluronic acid and what's the biological rationale behind this approach. We all question ourselves, what is the future of periodontal regeneration? And I really do think that the growth factors are still the presence and the future that we just haven't unlocked and utilized them in a way that we feel fit and we probably don't know uh, about them as much as we think we should do. With the growth factors, we also have to take account of the concept of guided tissue regeneration with the focus on two specific items, it's the space provision and the blood clot protection. And if we look at the study by Vikasio published years ago, we always think that cells have a different rate of producing the tissues, that cementoblast or cement regeneration is kind of slower than anything. But according to this histological studies, it says that the tissues virtually regenerate in parallel. So the cementum and the ligament and the bone, they virtually regenerate all at the same time. And recently, uh, three review studies have uh, three review studies have told us that actually monotherapy is less effective than if we use a combination approach of a grow of a bone filler uh, and combined with a growth factor. That it is much better that we combine something than if we use a monotherapy. And we know all these cases along tape of EMD that was done 20 years ago, and I'd like to show you a case that it works always very well and very predictable, and that 10 years later, these teeth that we know would probably be extracted are predictably regenerated and saved. So, how does hyaluronic acid work in this environment, and is it really a new regenerative aid in regeneration? In order to understand that, we have to know a little bit about how hyaluronic acid works on bone cells and bone formation. And a long time ago, published in Bone in 1995, the author showed us that actually high molecular weight hyaluronic acid does really accelerate new bone formation through mesenchymal stem differentiation. Furthermore, we know that the higher the molecular weight, the greater the proliferation, actually the mineralization rate of cells, especially uh, marrow-derived stem cells. Furthermore, uh, it's very interesting to see that actually hyaluronic acid also supports the SMAT signaling pathway, which is the BMP signaling pathway. And immediately, if you know something about BMPs, you really know and understand that if you have the SMAT signaling pathway activated, for sure you're going to get bone formation. 
Furthermore, uh, authors have shown in this uh, uh, chronic wound model of an extraction socket that hyaluronic acid by itself significantly increases mineralization formation and that you actually have faster bone formation and more mature bone formation and you actually have more mineralized tissue if you apply hyaluronic acid in an extraction socket. So, how does the hyaluronic acid work? Well, it, it works through the receptor, which is actually CD44. And it is the dominant receptor for hyaluronic acid. And actually, higher the molecular weight of this of hyaluronic acid, there are more binding sites for CD44. How does this relate, actually, to, uh, to the cells in the periodontal environment? A study in 2014 showed us what is the importance of CD44 in mineralization of periodontal ligament cells and what the authors did. They actually did a knockdown of CD44 and you can see here on the right side that there is really lack of mineralization or actually much less mineralization if you knock down the signaling. Furthermore, uh, hyaluronic acid works very well on PDL cells, uh, maintaining cell viability, increased proliferation and early osteogenic differentiation. And I'd like to share with you something also, uh, uh, something also new. We, we 10, 12, 15 years ago, we worked a lot at cementoblasts. And what we found also that in cementoblasts, CD44 is also expressed there. So there is every biological rationale to use hyaluronic acid for periodontal regeneration because obviously there's a lot of CD4 in PDL cells. There's a lot of CD4 in cementoblasts. And something quite new to just came in last week uh, with a group of authors from Turkey. We're looking at how hyaluronic acid is working on cementoblasts and in vitro wound models. And you can see here that this is the control group. And you see that hyaluronic acid in a dilution one to two. So it's a little bit diluted. The concentration is less than usually what we get in the specific hyaluronic acid that we use here. But you see that it really enhances wound closure. This is the in vitro wound model. And cementoblasts really close the wound already after two, two, start closing after two hours, four hours, six hours, and after 24 hours, basically the wound is closed. So it's very nice for me to see Piloni showing the data at looking at the 24 hour closure. So there's very fast. And the same thing is also happening with gingival fibroblasts. So this is the wound model, and you see by Six hours, actually, the cells have proliferated and closed the wound in these in, these in vitro wound models. What happens? Why is it important? Because the CD44 is a multifunctional cell surface glycoprotein, and as we said, the predominant receptor for hyaluronic acid. And in this study, it actually shows that CD44 in reactive cells on the dentin surface may possess the potential for formation of cementum and periodontal ligaments. So all of this biological data nicely supports the rationale of using hyaluronic acid uh, for periodontal regeneration. And in the this, in this systematic review published recently, the author stated that there is, there is a beneficial effect of using hyaluronic acid, more pocket closure, more clinical attachment gain. However, that there is considerable heterogeneity and a high risk of bias in some of these studies. So, when we think about it, when we know all of this data, and when we know the histology that was shown, the fantastic histology that was shown in the animal models, there is this really reason to use this molecule, actually, as a beneficial biologic, to use it for periodontal regeneration and other indications as we saw it. This particular Hyaluronic acid is actually cross-linked, and it's a combination of a, a high natural high molecular weight, 2.5 kilodaltons, and a molecular, uh, also a high molecular weight of 1,000 kilodaltons. And remember this, in its natural state, hyaluronic acid is a high molecular weight molecule, which is important to know. So I'd like to share with you a data that we accumulated over the fast, last few years. We did actually a case series, now we're conducting a randomized clinical trials comparing two different uh, surgical uh, approaches. And we had 27 patients with 20, uh, 24 patients with 27 defects, 
Uh, this is, the age was 54 years, the interbony component was quite deep, on average 7.2 millimeters. The angle was 26 degrees, it went up to 51 degrees, so we also had really wide, wide, deep and wide interbony defects, which are, not, which are uh, conductively not good for periodontal regeneration. We had really deep intrabony, uh, de uh, deep loss from the cement to enamel junction to the, uh, to the bottom of the pocket. And we had pretty wide, on average, intrabony defects, almost three and a half millimeter wide intrabony defects. And let me show with you, these are the typical type of the cases, okay? Most of our sites were actually two and one wall intrabony defects. So the ones that you would actually probably use a combination of a, another biologic and a bone graft or a non-resorbable membrane or a membrane in general. And uh, these are the cases and these are the six months follow-up. And look at the quality actually of remodeling of this bone. I mean, y we all know when we put a xenograft that it doesn't look like that after six months. It takes a long time for this material to get remodeled and, uh, and to mature. And another case, we see we had these really deep, deep defects. And we see pretty fast remodeling of this grafting particles in these cases. Even case like this, this case is, would be a mandatory to use a membrane in these completely non-contained, non-supportive defects in these, patient, in these patients. So let's look at this case. I mean, generally, I never choose a patient like this. You know, there's pus coming out. But I said at the university, we, kind of sometimes really have this uh, opportunity to do things that you wouldn't do in your private practice. So we took a case like this also with not adequate oral hygiene of this patient, and we took this deep defect going very close to the apex of the tooth, and uh, we applied it, and you see the patient is unable to maintain oral hygiene, but what tells me this is actually that even in these patients that are really the patients that you generally would never choose, that you do get nice results. And if we follow this patient for three years, we can maintain this attachment that we gain and we see continuous remodeling of the bone grafting particles. The only what changed in the meantime that he got endo treatment on this tooth a few years uh, later, not, not immediately after the surgery. How about this case here? The same thing, very close to the apex, two wall intrabony defect. This is six months later, and please observe this patient after three years. Look at the maturation of the bone graft, the consolidation of the achieved attachment. Still, the gain is nice, three millimeter pocket probing. And there's one other thing I'd like you to, to focus on. Look at the quality of the soft tissues from baseline to six months to three years. Observe the amount of new amount of keratinized gingiva that was achieved here. And I can tell you when we analyze the photos, this is something that we regularly see. This is not what we looked for, but this is something that we regularly see. So there is obviously a capacity of this molecule to work on soft tissues as well. In this site where you virtually almost had no keratinized gingiva here. Let's look at the case from the article. So we had a one ball intrabony defect with a small three wall in the apex. Uh, we applied EDTA on the root surface. Then we place a, a hyaluronic acid on the root surface to attach to the CD44 active cells. That, that, that's at least my biological rationale. We placed the bone graft combined with it. And then we coat it again with another layer of hyaluronic acid on top of it to stabilize it, to use it as, as, as a stabilizing agent again. We close it, and we see the six months result. Again, nice three millimeter pocket probing depth. And we follow this case almost for three years later. And we, when we look at the radiograph, we see corticalization here. So we see again maturation of the defect and continuous remodeling of the bone grafting material that we place there. If you look at the results of this, we achieved 3.6 millimeter of clinical attachment gain. The pocket depth reduction was 4.5 millimeters. And we had a pretty big recession, 0 0.9. But I owe this probably because the defects were mostly two and one wall deep intrabony defects very close to the apex of the tooth in most of these cases. When we look at uh, the graphs, we see that the deeper, of course, the initial 
uh, defect, uh, the higher the gain. And we see that on average, we, the mostly we got two, and a half milli two to three millimeters clinical attachment gain, but we also got almost 50% of the cases had attachment gains of four and more millimeter, which is also interesting and very uh, promising for us. If we look at the Pearson's correlation coefficient, we see that uh, what I said, that the PD reduction was related to the Cal gains and the preoperative uh, depth and the intrabony component were also positively correlated to the gains of clinical attachment gains and pocket depth reduction. But also that the early healing index, which we also measured, had no effect on the clinical attachment, which was a surprise for me. I thought that the sites that initially healed really nice would achieve even better results, but obviously that doesn't have uh, a role, and that means that hyaluronic acid works even if you don't have the perfect healing outcome in the first two weeks of the, uh, of the papilla, papillary area. So last year we had a publication by the, uh, by the group from Torino, and they looked at pocket resolution percentages in site where we, they use the papilla preservation flaps. And what they found is that if they had the pocket depth of three millimeters or less, only 61% of the sites had the pocket closure. If they looked at four millimeters or less, 92% of the sites usually is what you can achieve. Well, in this study, we had 51% uh, of the sites having two, three millimeters or less. And then uh, if we look at the sites that had four millimeters or less, it's another 40%. And overall, this gives us 92.6%. So we are up there with this approach as we have in a systematic review on the pocket closure uh, percentages. Uh, we also started to use uh, the entire papilla preservation flap and are doing now randomized clinical trial comparing the papilla preservation techniques. And I'll just show you a few cases like this. Uh, we're not only using the three-wall intrabony defects, but we're using one-wall and two-wall intrabony defects. And we can see that uh, they are very nice results. And this surgery actually is much easier than, than the papilla preservation flap, I can tell you, once you get used to it. And uh, just one case uh, with a long-term follow-up. Most of these cases are now two to three years, so hopefully we'll uh, uh, publish these results soon, so we'll have a longer-term data. Uh, let's look at this case. Uh, pretty big defect, uh, two-wall intrabony defect. This is how you do it. You just make a small vertical incision here. You tunnel under uh, the papilla. You keep it intact. Uh, you clean, close. And this is the baseline, one year. And this is two years later. And you can still see how the turnover of the bone graft, how it corticalizes from one year to two years, how this actually matures and looks better. So the conclusion is that hyaluronic acid has the potential to induce periodontal regeneration by creating a favorable biological environment. We observed fast bone remodeling when you use this molecule. And... Um, uh, I can tell you that it's also uh, quite uh, visible in GBR cases. It seems that the xenograft combined with hyaluronic further improves the clinical outcomes in terms of pocket reductions and cal gains. And, of course, we need another human histology, although we have fantastic animal histology provided by Shirakata. And with this, I'd like to thank you, and uh, I set uh, and leave it to the others. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Excellent. So the next presenter is Frederick Kaufman. He combined, in fact, hyaluronic acid with uh, bone graft for GBR. And Frederick, you have to push here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair, for that kind introduction. <coughs> I'm um, yeah, very happy to be here and talking about bone regeneration uh, procedures and how do we not have to change our techniques but can improve the result with just the use of hyaluronic acid. So what problems are we actually facing? On the one side, we're facing the issues of volume loss after the procedure of augmentation. On the other side, we're facing issues like that the quality of the bone is not ideal. And these situations, this was a re-entry done by a colleague um, of mine, and we're seeing these um, bone particles impacted by soft tissue. And do we really want to place an implant in these situations? 
I don't. So either we do another augmentation procedure with costs and also mobility for the patient, or we place an implant in the soft tissue and maybe facing not real like bone contact to our implant with other, with other issues. So is it a matter of technique or material we use, or is it the patient um, which uh, causes the issues? So when we look in the literature, we see basically that all procedures are more or less the same. Um, if we use particles, if we use bone plates, or if we use human bone, if we use whatever, um, we can about augment four to five millimeter bone in any direction, and it's not a matter of technique. It's, um, yeah, everything works the same. Um, the resorption in the first six months, so from time of bone augmentation to implant placement, is in all situations about 5 to 10 percent, around 0.3 to 0.7 millimeters. And is this shrinkage really something remodeling of the bone graft, or has it a different, um, different cause? If you look into data from Reno Burkhardt and Klaus Lang, they say if you have a perfect wound closure of your flap and if everything is tension free, the healing is better and you have about 90 to 100 percent of your augmented site if everything works fine after six months. So the wound closure has a huge impact of your augmented site. And um, uh, Miyamari and Mertens, they had a, um, yeah, a study concept. They looked into jaw bones, um, pig jaws. They did augmentation procedures and looked on the volume just after wound closure. So they did an augmentation, did x-rays before the wound closure, and did the wound closure and another x-ray, superimposing these images, and saw that basically the, um, yeah, the, the, the loss of your augmented side is coming through the pressure of your soft tissue on your augmented side. I did the same thing, a little different setup. I used a tenting screw instead to stabilize my bone graft, to use particulated bone, and uh, superimpose everything with a CBCT's image. And um, the results were pretty much the same. So they were kind of equal in all these three groups when it comes to particulated bone and the use of a collagen membrane. When you have a tucked membrane, the situation gets a little better. And if you use bone block, which is much more difficult than using a tenting screw in particulated bone, also the situation is kind of the same. 0.3 to 0.4 millimeter in bone loss. So it's kind of the same like in a human, even though these uh, models didn't live. They were just like a wound closure procedure. So this leads to the assumption that this loss in the first six months is more or less because of the wound closure. So how can hyaluronic acid help us in these situations? When we know that we have a better wound healing using hyaluronic acid, and if we have maybe additional stabilization using hyaluronic acid, the wound closure will be better, the healing will be better, and in the end, we're getting better bone with a higher volume. This is a case I just did this week. Um, first um, incisions, flap, augmentation procedure, and three days after, this is the picture um, on the bottom, we have a very, very nice wound healing, no swelling, no pain for the patient, and that's great from one side because pain and swelling isn't great. Pain is always, yeah, not perfect for the patient um, because all the adrenaline isn't like, um, perfect for the healing, as well as the swelling isn't great for the, for the patient because swelling always um, increases the pressure on your wound, and if you have pressure, the um, yeah, nutrition gets worse. So um, having less, um, less swelling, the result gets better. So um, hyaluronic acid, we can make the sticky bone where we can use or have additional stabilization just out of the drawer. We don't have to draw blood, we just have something uh, in a syringe ready to use and we, we give it to our bone particles and it becomes a sticky bone. So you can rehydrate it if you want to, you can use saline, you can use blood, use the addition, additional hyaluronic acid and it becomes really sticky and then you can place it in your augmented area to augment the bone and it becomes much easier because this kind of a putty situation what you have afterwards when you add the gel form hyaluronic acid to your bone particles it's much easier to yeah, shape it and you have less bone particles in your soft tissue because it's not like flowing around and it's um, not like little particles it's like everything sticks together so the application is much easier and this leads um, 
to the clinical situation. So when we have it in a, in a, in a study setup, we transport everything into the human, and this is what it looks like. So we have a little instrument with a huge amount of hyaluronic acid with uh, our bone particles, and we can place everything, we can shape the defect nice and easy, no need to rush, and uh, you, you already see that there is a, a certain stabilization just because of this yeah, gel-like putty situation you formed with your hyaluronic acid and your bone particles. And then the blood is kind of sucked into the hyaluronic acid, stabilizing a kind of a blood clot, which also helps us to get a better um, yeah, stability and a better wound, wound, um, wound healing. So when we look into the data, we did also measurements before the surgery, after surgery, and at time of implant placement. We saw that in these situations where we had, um, yeah, before the um, before the augmentation, we um, we had the groups with and without hyaluronic acid. The um, bone particles as well as the membrane stayed the same. So we were able to augment more bone in the group with hyaluronic acid. We were able to have less loss of volume and actually had better bone quality, and this is what I'm showing you in the next step. So we do not only have more bone, but also less loss. The effect on quality is also great, because you, again, you're not changing the technique, you're adding hyaluronic acid and getting better quality. This is something we all see in, in various situations. We have a re-entry and we have this yeah, soft bone. And uh, Daniel Thoma was checking if there is a need to remove this soft bone. He said, no, there is no need, and that's maybe correct, but if you look into the data um, in this group where he didn't remove the bone, this bone-to-implant contact, especially in the buccal aspect, is about 1.5 to 2 millimeters less good, so so in the first two millimeters from your implant shoulder down to your apex, you don't have any bone contact in the soft bone. And yeah, if you ask me, this isn't what I want to have. And the other issue is that when you look at comium CTs or x-rays, you don't actually see that you have soft bone. We always interpret these, these x-rays that the bone we augmented is perfect, but this isn't the case. So on one hand, we can't really see it in x-rays. On the other hand, when we do the reopening, we're facing sometimes issues we want to we wanna have. So what, we can, what can we do is we can hyaluronic acid um, as an yeah, extra to our native collagen membrane and the bone particles. And what we see is on the left side, this is the biopsy we did with the hyaluronic acid. We have very, very nice mature bone, very, very nicely healed. And on the other side, we have this soft tissue embedded bone particles on the top. In the lower part, we have a nice proper healing. But the top three millimeter are just like soft bone. It's more like a soft tissue than some, some hard tissue. So is it really a focus of, or a matter of technique, or is it really a matter of the material we use? Something else we are very able to observe is, and this is also, um, also um, uh, published in the literature, that we were able to see some rests of, of, of a membrane after six months after our bone augmentation procedure, and this is something really uncommon. So we also have an influence of our, on our uh, collagen membrane, that the barrier function stays intact over a prolonged time, and this will kind of inhibit um, yeah, soft tissue in growth in your bone particles. No need to change the membrane, use hyaluronic acid and you get better, better bone just because the membrane stays more stable. And the third observation was besides the quality and the um, volume was that we're not seeing much bone particles in our biopsies where we, place it, we were able to place the implants later on. We have very, very small particles up here and down here and some on the other side as well, but very, very little spots only. We were not able to see almost um, any of these particles. Now you can say, well, you did the biopsies in areas where we just have native bone and didn't do the augmentation procedures, and these are the situations we were including in these studies. So, it's a very, very narrow, thin margin of the bone, so these biopsies had to have some bone particles included, but we were not able to see them um, and on large scale in, in the biopsies. So, could hyaluronic acid be the answer? When we look in other studies, um, when it comes to healing of extraction sockets, we know that PDL fibers um, helping us um, to kind of speed up the wound healing and give us better bone. And um, we also know that um, hyaluronic acid is kind of inducing bone healing, CD44, we just heard about it. It's also helping PDL cells to feel very, very um, in a happy environment. And um, if you have very, very nice PDL cells, 
bone regeneration goes up. And this is the same situation when it comes to bone augmentation procedures, because in the end, PDL cells are somewhere in the area, and the bone particles are also surfaces where PDL cells can attach to, so you get better bone healing. So one situation um, in, a, in a human, we um, had a trauma case, um, a young man lost two teeth with a bone augmentation procedure, and then nothing, nothing special here. But when you look into it um, more closely, um, and you know how teeth are like, how situations look like, also the gum tissue looks like after a trauma, you have no scars in this situation. I don't see any. And you have a wonderful healed bone underneath, just bone particles, tenting screw, and the use of hyaluronic acid. It's easy to place the implants in an ideal position. And when you compare it with the other side, um, where the recessions, the, the side with, um, with the implants looks actually much, much better. No, yeah, it's, it actually looks like a native situation, like I did um, maybe an immediate implant, but this was a severe trauma situation. So the hyaluronic acid helps us to reduce morbidity, reduce swelling, reduce the um, kind of um, um, the degranulation of your barrier membrane. It gives additional stabilization, you have less scars um, in the healing process, and you get much, much better bone with easier handling. And there is no need to change your favorite um, technique. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. So, could you please come up to the podium to have a short discussion? <clears throat> and it would be nice to, to summarize what we have heard today. And if I... Excuse me? Yeah, yeah. Some, some five minutes, huh? We won't have a very long time, but um, I would like to make some statements because you have seen that by using hyaluronic acid for uh, different types of parental defects, we were able to prove parental regeneration histologically. That means formation of parental ligament, cementum, and alveolar bone in intrabony defects, in uh, recession defects, but also to a certain extent infurcation defect. Is that true, Dr. Shirakata? Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, could you please uh, explain? Yeah. Okay. Can we, we demonstrate parental regeneration yeah. in all these type of defects when, when using hyaluronic acid, especially the cross-link formulation? So we can make this statement nowadays, huh? Yeah. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, in this um, presentation, uh, regardless of the periodontal defect, uh, HA promoted uh, new attachment formation in every defect. Uh, of course, uh, uh, <coughs> class refurcation defect is a more challenging periodontal defect, and so the, we have to consider uh, appropriate carrier or scaffold combined with HA. But especially for the gingival recession, I think uh, HA is a very, very promising. Uh, uh, synthetic uh, agent compared to the EMD or yeah. uh, as a growth factor because uh, this cross-linked agent Very is good. a completely synthetic product, I think. Excellent. So we can make the statement that parental regeneration is enhanced by the use of hyaluronic acid, and we have the histologic proof for this. So this is a very important statement. And then uh, the indication, one of the indications is, of course, the use of hyaluronic acid in intrabonic parental defects, and uh, Professor Piloni has demonstrated that, and we can also use it for treating recessions, either using it alone, depending on the phenotype, probably, but we can also combine it with a connective tissue graft. Is that correct? Yes, very uh, shortly my answer, short my answer for the infrabony, because thanks to all of you, we now know that they chase into all <coughs> the calcified tissues and the soft tissues, mm -hmm. both levels, the epithelial cells and connective tissues, the connective tissue cells. And those infor that information now is easily moved into mucogingival surgery yeah. because we know the, the role that plays between you know, the two 
uh, surface layers that uh, communicate somehow. So HA allows cells to do the cell signaling to communicate and go into the towards the direction of the wound healing and attachment on the root surface. So and the regeneration of of defects for infrabony lesions. So it, it, we know that we are now into a level where we can explain really what it can do including the fact that the clot gets uh, stabilized, which is very crucial when it comes to, generally speaking, tissue Excellent. regenerating. And uh, another question um, to Professor Bozic. For large parental defects, that means no so-called non-contained intrabony parental defects, we can use the combination with a bone substitute, a bone graft and hyaluronic acid in order to additionally increase uh, the volume and to stabilize the, the wound and uh, to prevent the flap collapse. Is that correct? Yeah, you're absolutely correct, Tony. Uh, the one thing I want to say is that since this data, I think we did close to probably 70, 80 cases now already. Mm -hmm. So we really have now the experience and we have the longer term results, three to four years of follow-up of these cases. So I can tell you now that it, work, it doesn't work in every case, of course, but in 92%, 95% of the cases, it's gonna work really nicely. Perfect, And we, we're gonna also have, as I, I told uh, Andrea, that uh, we have to wait. We see the benefit of soft tissues, and, uh, but you have to wait for this benefit mm -hmm. to observe. It's not gonna be immediately. You, you're gonna see it as a trend. So give the tissue time to heal. Exactly. And if I go over to Frederick, I think that we may even use hyaluronic acid in the crossing formulation combined with a bone graft for bone augmentation when we don't have a tooth but we have larger defects. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, 100%. It not only has a um, very, very high effect on the volume but also on soft tissue healing. Soft tissue inf healing influences the bone healing. It has an influence on, on the membrane, on the degradation um, speed of the membrane. This is, has an effect on the, on the bone graft. So there's a huge impact um, yeah. on, on bone healing. And last but not least, I think that uh, one important point, because the first step of parental treatment is the non-surgical approach. So the combination of uh, plaque control and uh, biofilm removal by using, uh, uh, for example, the, the perisolved uh, natrium hypochlorite combined with some amino acids, and of course, after uh, removal of the biofilm, enhancing wound healing uh, in a non-surgical environment with uh, the use of the colostrum hyaluronic acid uh, may have a positive effect. Is that correct? Because you have experience of that. Yes, Tony. Um, definitely, I see uh, this great benefit in closing the pocket and without any additional manipulation, we don't avoid bleeding uh, Actually, we wish us even uh, some bleeding from the pocket, uh, as we all learned, uh, you know, uh, to, to avoid, to try mm -hmm. to, to constrict somehow the defect after instrumentation, subgingivally to keep the blood clot as uh, little, as small as possible. Uh, Today, it's uh, rather an opposite uh, way around. So we catch uh, this blood with this hyaluronic acid, and uh, I think the effects we discussed today are all present even in a non-surgical application. Excellent. So um, I think we had a great session today, and uh, we can summarize the indications for hyaluronic acid, non-surgical parental treatment. Of course, we need to remove the biofilm. But then also when we perform a regenerative surgery in intrabony defects, in recession coverage surgery, either with or without a connective tissue graft, but also in the treatment of uh, larger intrabony defects combined with the bone substitute. But probably in certain cases where we have a class two furcation defect and uh, even in bone augmentation procedures, so we have more and more data uh, that support the clinical relevance of this biologic approach. And uh, of course, um, these have to be validated by large RCTs, but um, um, we have a quite solid biologic foundation of uh, this application. 
So this is the take home message. I hope that you have enjoyed and thank you for the great presentations. Thank you.